Um, I want to focus on the question of representation in the creative industry and um, do a bit of a summary of the main arguments that we've uh, have in great part already heard this morning uh, and then go to what I think are the crucial questions that our colleagues here at the table should uh, answer in their interventions. Uh, so I hope they will be willing to do that. Uh, so we're talking first of all, and that has been said um, in much detail already, I think, uh, to in, in terms of representation, the creative sector is an atypical uh, sector, especially in the three countries that we've been working in, uh, which are countries that are uh, totally full of collective agreements, uh, where trade unions and employers' organizations are uh, key actors, uh, they cover most of the economy, and in this sector, this is not the case. And that makes it for people like me who study um, labor relations and who study forms of representation makes it very interesting because it's, it's different, it's uh, in a way new and it's not so boring as the things we've been doing for many, many years. So that, that I like that. Uh, it's a sector where you have hardly any unionization, you have hardly any unions actually, you hardly have any employers' organizations and with the exception of a few sectors like uh, journalism, there are actually hardly any collective agreements, which is pretty special in these three countries because these are three countries that are totally governed, the rest of the labor market is completely governed by collective agreements. So uh, we talk about something different, which is great, I think. And we talk about a sector which is where if there is representation, it's more representation by occupational organizations, uh, organizations that do not uh, see themselves as representatives of workers or of employers or of self-employed, but of people who work in a certain profession, eh, in a certain occupation, they have an identity that is related to what they do and not so much uh, to the relationship they have to the other in, in the, the workplace. So that, that is a, a quite a, a different thing than the biggest part of the labor market that does have this, let's say, this old uh, situation. Now why is, is it that this sector is then different? Why are these creative uh, occupations so different? I think there are a number of reasons. One is that we talk about private sector services, full of small enterprises with high share of freelance workers. These are everywhere the sectors where you have less unionization, less employers organization, and less collective agreement. That's one thing. La batteria è quasi scarica. Allora, anche la mia presentazione è quasi scarica. So I'll be fast. Um, it's a sector where you have occupational identities, which means that the boundaries between traditional categories of workers, self-employed, and employers... I'll be quick and it's, uh, it's all going to be okay. So we, we have the, we, the categories of worker, employer, and freelancer are actually blurred. And we've heard this morning already, some people are all three things at the same time. And if the, somebody's a worker today, tomorrow he'll be the employer, and the day after he'll be self-employed. That's the second reason. The third reason is that it's a sector where people work because they like it, and where they do things that they actually give them fulfillment, at least that is sort of the dominant discourse that you hear there, and I think to, to a large part this is uh, actually true. People get a lot of uh, satisfaction from what they do, they want to be creative, uh, they want to have autonomy, they see their work as a hobby, and in the interviews many times they told us, hey, if, if you're in the creative sector you know you're not going to be rich, except when you make uh, the next Minecraft or something, but very few people make the next Minecraft, so you're not in it for the money. It is a thing you're in because you want to do it. Uh, I think those are the, the three main reasons why this sector is different. Um, and if you look at from the side of interest representation, if you look at the traditional organizations, unions, employers' organizations, you also see that they don't really know what to do with this sector. They don't know how to connect to this sector. And if a trade union goes to a, a gaming company, it will not be a very lively conversation because they don't have many things to tell each other. And it's the same with employers' organizations uh, because they, they work with other categories, they have other uh, frames in mind, other roles in mind than you can find in the uh, creative sector. That doesn't mean that the traditional organizations don't do anything useful for these sectors. It means that it's difficult for them. And I think the most useful things that we've seen that they do 
are, let's say, more general uh, activities they have for self-employed or for freelancers, where they more in general terms support freelancers and self-employed with training or with access to social security and things like this. Now, if we look then at the great, <laughs> okay, <laughs> shall I take it out? <laughs> okay, I think we died now. What shall we do? I changed my slides during the previous session, so I don't really know exactly what they say, so I really need them. <laughs> so if we talk about representation in the creative sector, we've already established that it's different. What does it do? And what we found in our uh, research, we've seen that um, People like we had in the people like these two Dutch guys there, for example, um, and more representatives of creative sectors. What do they do? One is they, they represent the whole creative sector or the subsector of graphic design or games or whatever uh, towards the government and towards education institutions and towards municipalities, which are important actors to them uh, for all kind of uh, regulations, investments, uh, cooperation. They represent the sector or subsector abroad to markets, to possible investors. Uh, they try to strengthen networks, they, uh, networks between companies that can cooperate with each other, companies, freelancers, knowledge institutions, uh, universities, uh, training institutions, municipalities, again, also across sectors and also across national borders. Um, another type of representation that they can have is regulating the sector or the subsector by setting standards, sometimes informal standards. In, in our uh, Dutch study we had an interesting example of the uh, graphic design sector where the occupational um, organization that sort of represents the whole sector has a, what they call a guideline. It's, it's basically like the, the uh, salary scales in a collective agreement, only that it's not negotiated between workers and employers, but just among themselves. And it's not obligatory, but it's voluntary. And that's a, a way how they regulate in an informal way the sector, and actually the sector rep uh, respects these standards quite well, actually. So it's actually fairly well working type of regulation. And finally, and that's maybe uh, the, the, the most important role that uh, representation organizations play, they provide all kinds of services. Uh, they provide legal assistance or training, or uh, and they give information on how to run a business, how to deal with your taxes. They set up hubs or incubators where uh, companies can grow, uh, startups. They help uh, with collective insurances to make them more accessible or uh, cheaper. Uh, they try to develop access to social security uh, arrangements. And this is also a kind of representation that, uh, that we find in this sector. And most of these, maybe not so much the last one, but most of these um, types of representation are different than in the traditional sectors and with the traditional actors. Now what now for the future? And these, these are then, uh, you can see I'm almost finished, um, questions to my colleagues here at the table. Um, three questions I think that are important. One is, um, Luigi started uh, by calling this uh, conference strategic but vulnerable, so we have to focus to some extent on the vulnerable question. And of course this is a sector where uh, we see a lot of uh, satisfaction and passion and creativity, but we also see a lot of vulnerability. I was just talking to my colleague from the Dutch game industry. He said, yeah, if you're vulnerable and you work in the games, your problem. Um, but maybe representative organizations would have a different view on this. And I would be interested to see that even in the situation where Marx has been uh, uh, dead for a while, if representation can be used to reduce vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability, on the one hand, in terms of earnings or insecurity, in terms of complicated working time arrangements, uh, lack of work-life balance and access to social security 
and that let's say the, the vulnerability of the individual and in the second uh, the vulnerability of the sector we've also heard that uh, there is a lot of uh, the, the economic fluctuations changes in clients demand maybe also the power of the client is sometimes uh, you, you could say excessive um, in, in the, especially in the graphic design industry many people are complaining that that client organizations do not have any feeling for the value added that they add to the product and therefore they never want to pay them any decent uh, money, can collective representation do something about it? That, that, that's the first question I think we have. If the question to that is yes, then the second question is what should it look like? Uh, what, what should representative organizations do and what would be the priorities? What would the, be the points they should focus on? And um, third question is then, uh, the experience of the colleagues here at the table uh, should tell us something about uh, what what works, what kind of representation works, what leads to uh, good outcomes, what uh, good examples uh, exist. And I think we've heard already some of those uh, this morning, but I'm sure that there are others uh, here at the table as well. And then I only want to say grazie mille and I'll leave the floor to the rest. Thank you.